The 1948 Palestinian exodus, also known as the Nakba Arabic, Alpt al -Nakba, literally, disaster, catastrophe, or cataclysm, occurred when more than 700,000 Palestinian Arabs—about half of pre-war Palestine's Arab population—fled or were expelled from their homes, during the 1948 Palestine War. Between 400 and 600 Palestinian villages were sacked during the war, while urban Palestine was almost entirely extinguished. The term, Nakba, also refers to the period of war itself and events affecting Palestinians from December 1947 to January 1949. The precise number of refugees, many of whom settled in refugee camps in neighboring states, is a matter of dispute but around 80% of the Arab inhabitants of what became Israel half of the Arab total of mandatory Palestine left or were expelled from their homes. About 250,000 to 300,000 Palestinians fled or were expelled before the Israeli Declaration of Independence in May 1948, a fact which was named as a casus belli for the entry of the Arab League into the country, sparking the 1948 Arab-Israeli War. The causes are also a subject of fundamental disagreement between historians. Factors involved in the exodus include Jewish military advances, destruction of Arab villages, psychological warfare, and fears of another massacre by Zionist militias after the Deir Yassin massacre, which caused many to leave out of panic, direct expulsion orders by Israeli authorities, the voluntary self-removal of the wealthier classes, collapse in Palestinian leadership and Arab evacuation orders, and an unwillingness to live under Jewish control. Later, a series of laws passed by the first Israeli government prevented them from returning to their homes or claiming their property. They and many of their descendants remain refugees. The expulsion of the Palestinians has since been described by some historians as ethnic cleansing, while others dispute this charge, the status of the refugees, and in particular whether Israel will grant them their claimed right to return to their homes or be compensated, are key issues in the ongoing Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The events of 1948 are commemorated by Palestinians both in the Palestinian territories and elsewhere on 15 May, a date now known as Nakba Day. History The history of the Palestinian exodus is closely tied to the events of the war in Palestine, which lasted from 1947 to 1949, and to the political events preceding it. In September 1949, the United Nations Conciliation Commission for Palestine estimated 711,000 Palestinian refugees existed outside Israel, with about one quarter of the estimated 160,000 Palestinian Arabs remaining in Israel as internal refugees. Topic: <laughs> December 1947 to March 1948. In the first few months of the Civil War, the climate in the Mandate of Palestine became volatile, although throughout this period both Arab and Jewish leaders tried to limit hostilities. According to historian Benny Morris, the period was marked by Palestinian Arab attacks and Jewish defensiveness, increasingly punctuated by Jewish reprisals. Simha Flappin pointed out that attacks by the Irgun and Lehi resulted in Palestinian Arab retaliation and condemnation. Jewish reprisal operations were directed against villages and neighborhoods from which attacks against Jews were believed to have originated. The retaliations were more damaging than the provoking attack and included killing of armed and unarmed men, destruction of houses, and sometimes expulsion of inhabitants. The Zionist groups of Ergun and Lehi reverted to their 1937-1939 strategy of indiscriminate attacks by placing bombs and throwing grenades into crowded places such as bus stops, shopping centers and markets. Their attacks on British forces reduced British troops' ability and willingness to protect Jewish traffic. General conditions deteriorated, the economic situation became unstable, and unemployment grew. Rumors spread that the Husseinists were planning to bring in bands of Felahin, peasant farmers, to take over the towns. Some Palestinian Arab leaders sent their families abroad. Yoav Gelber claims that the Arab Liberation Army embarked on a systematic evacuation of non-combatants from several frontier villages in order to turn them into military strongholds. Arab depopulation occurred most in villages close to Jewish settlements and in vulnerable neighborhoods in Haifa, Jaffa and West Jerusalem. The more impoverished inhabitants of these neighborhoods generally fled to other parts of the city. Those who could afford to fled further away, expecting to return when the troubles were over. 
By the end of March 1948 30 villages were depopulated of their Palestinian Arab population. Approximately 100,000 Palestinian Arabs had fled to Arab parts of Palestine, such as Gaza, Beersheba, Haifa, Nazareth, Nablus, Jaffa and Bethlehem. Some had left the country altogether, to Jordan, Lebanon and Egypt. Other sources speak of 30,000 Palestinian Arabs. Many of these were Palestinian Arab leaders, middle and upper class Palestinian Arab families from urban areas. Around the 22nd of March, the Arab governments agreed that their consulates in Palestine would issue entry visas only to old people, women, children and the sick. On 29-30 March the Haganah Intelligence Service his reported that the AHC was no longer approving exit permits for fear of causing panic in the country. The Haganah was instructed to avoid spreading the conflagration by stopping indiscriminate attacks and provoking British intervention. On the 18th of December 1947, the Haganah approved an aggressive defence strategy, which in practice meant a limited implementation of Plan May, also known as Plan Gimel, or Plan C, Tachnit Mai, or Tachnit Gimel which, produced in May 1946, was the Haganah master plan for the defense of the Yishuv in the event of the outbreak of new troubles the moment the British were gone. Plan Gimel included retaliation for assaults on Jewish houses and roads. In early January, the Haganah adopted Operation Zarzir, a scheme to assassinate leaders affiliated to Amin al Husseini, placing the blame on other Arab leaders, but in practice, few resources were devoted to the project, and the only attempted killing was of Nimr al Khatib. The only authorized expulsion at this time took place at Khazaria, south of Haifa, where Palestinian Arabs were evicted and their houses destroyed on 19 20 February 1948. In attacks that were not authorized in advance, several communities were expelled by the Haganah and several others were chased away by the Irgun. According to Elon Pape, the Zionists organized a campaign of threats, consisting of the distribution of threatening leaflets, violent reconnaissance, and, after the arrival of mortars, the shelling of Arab villages and neighborhoods. Pape also notes that the Haganah shifted its policy from retaliation to offensive initiatives during the long seminar. A meeting of Ben Gurion with his chief advisors in January 1948, the main point was that it was desirable to transfer as many Arabs as possible out of Jewish territory, and the discussion focused mainly on the implementation. The experience gained in a number of attacks in February 1948, notably those on Khazaria and Sasa, was used in the development of a plan detailing how enemy population centers should be handled. According to Pape, Plan Dilet was the master plan for the expulsion of the Palestinians. However, according to Gelber, Plan Dilet instructions were, in case of resistance, the population of conquered villages was to be expelled outside the borders of the Jewish state. If no resistance was met, the residents could stay put. Under military rule, Palestinian belligerency in these first few months was disorganized, sporadic and localized and for months remained chaotic and incoordinated, if not undirected. Husseini lacked the resources to mount a full-scale assault on the Yishuv, and restricted himself to sanctioning minor attacks and to tightening the economic boycott. The British claimed that Arab rioting might well have subsided had the Jews not retaliated with firearms. Overall, Morris concludes that during this period the Arab evacuees from the towns and villages left largely because of Jewish Haganah, Izl or LHI attacks or fear of impending attack. But that only an extremely small, almost insignificant number of the refugees during this early period left because of Haganah or Izl or LHI expulsion orders or forceful advice to that effect. In this sense, Glazer quotes the testimony of Count Bernadotte, the UN mediator in Palestine, who reported that the exodus of the Palestinian Arabs resulted from panic created by fighting in their communities, by rumors concerning real or alleged acts of terrorism, or expulsion. Almost the whole of the Arab population fled or was expelled from the area under Jewish occupation. <laughs> April–June 1948 
By 1 May 1948, two weeks before the Israeli Declaration of Independence, nearly 175,000 Palestinians approximately 25% had already fled. The fighting in these months was concentrated in the Jerusalem Tel Aviv area. On 9 April, the Deir Yassin massacre and the rumors that followed it spread fear among the Palestinians. Next, the Haganah defeated local militia in Tiberias. On 21–22 April in Haifa, after the Haganah waged a day and a half battle including psychological warfare, the Jewish National Committee was unable to offer the Palestinian Council assurance that an unconditional surrender would proceed without incident. Finally, Ergun under Menachem Begin fired mortars on the infrastructure in Jaffa. Combined with the fear inspired by Deir Yassin, each of these military actions resulted in panicked Palestinian evacuations. The significance of the attacks by underground military groups Ergun and Lehi on Deir Yassin is underscored by accounts on all sides. Marin Benvenisti regards Deir Yassin as a turning point in the annals of the destruction of the Arab landscape. <laughs> Haifa Palestinians fled the city of Haifa en masse, in one of the most notable flights of this stage. Historian Ephraim Karsh writes that not only had half of the Arab community in Haifa community fled the city before the final battle was joined in late April 1948, but another 5,000 to 15,000 left apparently voluntarily during the fighting while the rest, some 15,000 to 25,000, were ordered to leave, as was initially claimed by an Israeli source. On the instructions of the Arab Higher Committee, Karsh concludes that there was no Jewish grand design to force this departure, and that in fact the Haifa Jewish leadership tried to convince some Arabs to stay, to no avail. Walid Khalidi disputes this account, saying that two independent studies, which analyzed CIA and BBC intercepts of radio broadcasts from the region, concluded that no orders or instructions were given by the Arab Higher Committee. According to Morris, the Haganah mortar attacks of 21 to 22 April on Haifa were primarily designed to break Arab morale in order to bring about a swift collapse of resistance and speedy surrender. But clearly the offensive, and especially the mortaring, precipitated the exodus. The three-inch mortars opened up on the market square where there was a great crowd. A great panic took hold. The multitude burst into the port, pushed aside the policemen, charged the boats and began to flee the town. As the official Haganah history later put it, according to Pape, this mortar barrage was deliberately aimed at civilians to precipitate their flight from Haifa. The Haganah broadcast a warning to Arabs in Haifa on 21 April, "...that unless they sent away infiltrated dissidents they would be advised to evacuate all women and children, because they would be strongly attacked from now on," commenting on the use of "...psychological warfare broadcasts," and military tactics in Haifa, Benny Morris writes, Throughout the Haganah made effective use of Arabic language broadcasts and loudspeaker vans. Haganah Radio announced that the Day of Judgment had arrived, and called on inhabitants to kick out the foreign criminals, and to move away from every house and street, from every neighborhood occupied by foreign criminals. The Haganah broadcasts called on the populace to evacuate the women, the children and the old immediately, and send them to a safe haven. Jewish tactics in the battle were designed to stun and quickly overpower opposition, demoralization was a primary aim. It was deemed just as important to the outcome as the physical destruction of the Arab units. The mortar barrages and the psychological warfare broadcasts and announcements, and the tactics employed by the infantry companies, advancing from house to house, were all geared to this goal. The orders of Carmeli's 22nd Battalion were, to kill every adult male Arab encountered, and to set alight with fire bombs, all objectives that can be set alight. I am sending you posters in Arabic, disperse en route." By mid-May 4,000 Arabs remained in Haifa. These were concentrated in Wadi Nisnas in accordance with Plan D whilst the systematic destruction of Arab housing in certain areas, which had been planned before the war, was implemented by Haifa's technical and urban development departments in cooperation with the IDF's city commander Yaakov Lublini. Topic. Further events. According to Glazer, 1980, p. 111, from the 15th of May 1948 onwards, expulsion of Palestinians became a regular practice. 
Avnery explaining the Zionist rationale, says, I believe that during this phase, the eviction of Arab civilians had become an aim of David Ben-Gurion and his government. UN opinion could very well be disregarded. Peace with the Arabs seemed out of the question, considering the extreme nature of the Arab propaganda. In this situation, it was easy for people like Ben Gurion to believe the capture of uninhabited territory was both necessary for security reasons and desirable for the homogeneity of the new Hebrew state. Based on research of numerous archives, Morris provides an analysis of Haganah induced flight. Undoubtedly, as was understood by IDF intelligence, the most important single factor in the exodus of April to June was Jewish attack. This is demonstrated clearly by the fact that each exodus occurred during or in the immediate wake of military assault. No town was abandoned by the bulk of its population before the Haganah, IZL assault. The closer drew the 15 May British withdrawal deadline and the prospect of invasion by Arab states, the readier became commanders to resort to cleansing operations and expulsions to rid their rear areas. R. Relatively few commanders faced the moral dilemma of having to carry out the expulsion clauses. Townspeople and villagers usually fled their homes before or during battle. Though Haganah commanders almost invariably prevented inhabitants, who had initially fled, from returning home, Edgar Obalance, a military historian, adds, Israeli vans with loudspeakers drove through the streets ordering all the inhabitants to evacuate immediately, and such as were reluctant to leave were forcibly ejected from their homes by the triumphant Israelis whose policy was now openly one of clearing out all the Arab civil population before them. From the surrounding villages and hamlets, during the next two or three days, all the inhabitants were uprooted and set off on the road to Ramallah. No longer was there any reasonable persuasion. Bluntly, the Arab inhabitants were ejected and forced to flee into Arab territory. Wherever the Israeli troops advanced into Arab country the Arab population was bulldozed out in front of them. After the fall of Haifa the villages on the slopes of Mount Carmel had been harassing the Jewish traffic on the main road to Haifa. A decision was made on 9 May 1948 to expel or subdue the villages of Kafr Saba, Al Tira, Kakun, Kualansawa, and Tantara. On of May 1948, Ben Gurion convened the consultancy. The outcome of the meeting is confirmed in a letter to commanders of the Haganah brigades telling them that the Arab Legion's offensive should not distract their troops from the principal tasks. The cleansing of Palestine remained the prime objective of Plan Dilette. The attention of the commanders of the Alexandroni Brigade was turned to reducing the Mount Carmel pocket. Tantara, being on the coast, gave the Carmel villages access to the outside world and so was chosen as the point to surround the Carmel villages as a part of the coastal clearing offensive operation in the beginning of the 1948 Arab-Israeli War. On the night of 22-23 May 1948, one week and one day after the declaration of independence of the State of Israel, the coastal village of Tantara was attacked and occupied by the 33rd Battalion of the Alexandroni Brigade of the Haganah. The village of Tantara was not given the option of surrender and the initial report spoke of dozens of villagers killed, with 300 adult male prisoners and 200 women and children. Many of the villagers fled to Faridus previously captured and to Arab-held territory. The captured women of Tantara were moved to Faridus, and on 31 May Brecker Shitrit, Minister of Minority Affairs of the Provisional Government of Israel, sought permission to expel the refugee women of Tantara from Faridus as the number of refugees in Faridus was causing problems of overcrowding and sanitation, a report from the military intelligence shy of the Haganah entitled, The Emigration of Palestinian Arabs in the Period January 12, 1947 to January 6, 1948. Dated 30 June 1948, affirms that at least 55% of the total of the exodus was caused by our Haganah, IDF operations. To this figure, the report's compilers add the operations of the Irgun and Lehi, which directly caused some 15% of the emigration. A further 2% was attributed to explicit expulsion orders issued by Israeli troops, and 1% to their psychological warfare. This leads to a figure of 73% for departures caused directly by the Israelis. In addition, the report attributes 22% of the departures to fears and a crisis of confidence affecting the Palestinian population. 
As for Arab calls for flight, these were reckoned to be significant in only 5% of cases. According to Morris's estimates, 250,000 to 300,000 Palestinians left Israel during this stage. Keizing's contemporary archives in London place the total number of refugees before Israel's independence at 300,000, in Clause 10. B. of Thessabalgram from the Secretary General of the League of Arab States to the UN Secretary General of 15 May 1948 justifying the intervention by the Arab states, the Secretary General of the League alleged that approximately over a quarter of a million of the Arab population have been compelled to leave their homes and emigrate to neighboring Arab countries. Topic. July to October 1948 Israeli operations labeled Dani and Dekel that broke the truce were the start of the third phase of expulsions. The largest single expulsion of the war began in Lida and Ramla 14 July when 60,000 inhabitants nearly 10% of the whole exodus of the two cities were forcibly expelled on the orders of Ben Gurion and Yitzhak Rabin in events that came to be known as the Lida Death March. According to Flappen 1987, pp. 13-14 in Ben Gurion's view Ram Law and Lida constituted a special danger because their proximity might encourage cooperation between the Egyptian army, which had started its attack on Kibbutz Negba, near Ram Law, and the Arab Legion, which had taken the Lida police station. However, the author considers that Operation Dani, under which the two towns were seized, revealed that no such cooperation existed. In Flappen's opinion, in Lida, the exodus took place on foot. In Ramla, the IDF provided buses and trucks. Originally, all males had been rounded up and enclosed in a compound, but after some shooting was heard, and construed by Ben Gurion to be the beginning of an Arab Legion counteroffensive, he stopped the arrests and ordered the speedy eviction of all the Arabs, including women, children, and the elderly. In explanation, Flappen cites that Ben Gurion said that. Those who made war on us bear responsibility after their defeat," Rabin wrote in his memoirs. What would they do with the 50,000 civilians in the two cities? Not even Ben Gurion could offer a solution, and during the discussion at Operation Headquarters, he remained silent, as was his habit in such situations. Clearly, we could not leave Lida's hostile and armed populace in our rear, where it could endanger the supply route to the troops who were advancing eastward. Alone repeated the question, what is to be done with the population? Ben Gurion waved his hand in a gesture that said, drive them out. Driving out is a term with a harsh ring. Psychologically, this was one of the most difficult actions we undertook. The population of Lida did not leave willingly. There was no way of avoiding the use of force and warning shots in order to make the inhabitants march the 10 to 15 miles to the point where they met up with the legion. Soldier of Peace. P. 140-141 Flappen maintains that events in Nazareth, although ending differently, point to the existence of a definite pattern of expulsion. On 16 July, three days after the Lida and Ramla evictions, the city of Nazareth surrendered to the IDF. The officer in command, a Canadian Jew named Ben Dunkelman, had signed the surrender agreement on behalf of the Israeli army along with Chaim Laskov, then a brigadier general, later IDF chief of staff. The agreement assured the civilians that they would not be harmed, but the next day, Laskov handed Dunkelman an order to evacuate the population, which Dunkelman refused. Additionally, widespread looting and several cases of rape took place during the evacuation. In total, about 100,000 Palestinians became refugees in this stage according to Morris. <laughs> October 1948 to March 1949 This period of the exodus was characterized by Israeli military accomplishments. Operation Yoav, in October, this cleared the road to the Negev, culminating in the capture of Beersheba. Operation Hahar, that same month, which cleared the Jerusalem corridor from pockets of resistance. Operation Hiram, at the end of October, resulted in the capture of the Upper Galilee. Operation Horav in December 1948 and Operation Uvda in March 1949 completed the capture of the Negev. The Negev had been allotted to the Jewish state by by the United Nations these operations were met with resistance from the Palestinian Arabs who were to become refugees. The Israeli military activities were confined to the Galilee and the sparsely populated Negev Desert. 
it was clear to the villages in the Galilee, that if they left, return was far from imminent. Therefore, far fewer villages spontaneously depopulated than previously. Most of the Palestinian exodus was due to a clear, direct cause, expulsion and deliberate harassment, as Morris writes. Commanders were clearly bent on driving out the population in the area they were conquering. During Operation Hiram in the Upper Galilee, Israeli military commanders received the order, Do all you can to immediately and quickly purge the conquered territories of all hostile elements in accordance with the orders issued. The residents should be helped to leave the areas that have been conquered. The 31st of October 1948, Moshe Carmel, the UN's acting mediator, Ralph Bunch, reported that United Nations observers had recorded extensive looting of villages in Galilee by Israeli forces, who carried away goats, sheep, and mules. This looting, United Nations observers reported, appeared to have been systematic as army trucks were used for transportation. The situation, states the report, created a new influx of refugees into Lebanon. Israeli forces, he stated, have occupied the area in Galilee formerly occupied by Kaukji's forces, and have crossed the Lebanese frontier. Bunch goes on to say, that Israeli forces now hold positions inside the southeast corner of Lebanon, involving some 15 Lebanese villages which are occupied by small Israeli detachments. According to Morris altogether 200,000 to 230,000 Palestinians left in this stage. According to Elon Pape, in a matter of seven months, 531 villages were destroyed and 11 urban neighborhoods emptied. The mass expulsion was accompanied by massacres, rape and the imprisonment of men in labor camps for periods of over a year. Topic. Contemporary mediation and the Lausanne Conference Topic. UN mediation The United Nations, using the offices of the United Nations Truce Supervision Organization and the Mixed Armistice Commissions, was involved in the conflict from the very beginning. In the autumn of 1948 the refugee problem was a fact and possible solutions were discussed. Count Folk Bernadotte said on 16 September, No settlement can be just and complete if recognition is not accorded to the right of the Arab refugee to return to the home from which he has been dislodged. It would be an offense against the principles of elemental justice if these innocent victims of the conflict were denied the right to return to their homes while Jewish immigrants flow into Palestine, and indeed, offer the threat of permanent replacement of the Arab refugees who have been rooted in the land for centuries. UN General Assembly Resolution 194, passed on of December 1948 and reaffirmed every year since, was the first resolution that called for Israel to let the refugees return. The refugees wishing to return to their homes and live at peace with their neighbors should be permitted to do so at the earliest practicable date, and that compensation should be paid for the property of those choosing not to return and for loss of or damage to property which, under principles of international law or in equity, should be made good by the governments or authorities responsible. Topic. Lausanne Conference of 1949 At the start of the Lausanne Conference of 1949, on 12 May 1949, Israel agreed in principle to allow the return of all Palestinian refugees. At the same time, Israel became a member of the UN upon the passage of United Nations General Assembly Resolution 273 on of May 1949, which read, in part, Noting furthermore the declaration by the State of Israel that it unreservedly accepts the obligations of the United Nations Charter and undertakes to honor them from the day when it becomes a member of the United Nations." Instead Israel made an offer of allowing 100,000 of the refugees to return to the area, though not necessarily to their homes, including 25,000 who had returned surreptitiously and 10,000 family reunion cases. The proposal was conditional on a peace treaty that would allow Israel to retain the territory it had captured which had been allocated to the Arab state by the United Nations Partition Plan for Palestine, and, contrary to Israel's UN acceptance promise, on the Arab states absorbing the remaining 550,000 to 650,000 refugees. The Arab states rejected the proposal on both legal, moral and political grounds, and Israel quickly withdrew its limited offer. Benny Morris, in his 2004 book, 
the birth of the Palestinian refugee problem revisited, summarizes it from his perspective. In retrospect, it appeared that at Lausanne was lost the best and perhaps only chance for a solution of the refugee problem, if not for the achievement of a comprehensive Middle East settlement. But the basic incompatibility of the initial starting positions and the unwillingness of the two sides to move, and to move quickly, towards a compromise, born of Arab rejectionism and a deep feeling of humiliation, and of Israeli drunkenness with victory and physical needs determined largely by the Jewish refugee influx, doomed the conference. From the start, American pressure on both sides, lacking a sharp, determined cutting edge, failed to budge sufficiently either Jew or Arab. The 100,000 offer was a classic of too little, too late. Topic. Debate on the causes of the Palestinian exodus Topic. Initial positions In the first decades after the Exodus, two diametrically opposed schools of analysis could be distinguished. Israel claims that the Arabs left because they were ordered to, and deliberately incited into panic, by their own leaders who wanted the field cleared for the 1948 war. While the Arabs charged that their people were evicted at bayonet point and by panic deliberately incited by the Zionists. Alternative explanations had also been offered. For instance Peretz and Gabay emphasize the psychological component, panic or hysteria swept the Palestinians and caused the exodus. The dominant Israeli narrative was presented in the publications of various Israeli state institutions such as the National Information Center, the Ministry of Education History and, Civic Textbooks and the Army IDF, as well as in Israeli Jewish societal institutions, newspapers, memoirs of 1948 war veterans, and in the studies of the research community. However, a number of Jewish scholars living outside of Israel, including Gabay and Peretz, since the late 1950s presented a different narrative. According to this narrative, some Palestinians left willingly while others were expelled by the Jewish and later Israeli fighting forces. Topic changes in the Israeli representation of the causes for the exodus Late 1970s the dominance in Israel of the willing flight Zionist narrative of the exodus began to be challenged by Israeli Jewish societal institutions beginning mainly in the late 1970s. Many scholarly studies and daily newspaper essays, as well as some 1948 Jewish war veterans memoirs have begun presenting the more balanced narrative at times called onwards a post-Zionist. According to this narrative, some Palestinians left willingly due to calls of Arab or their leadership to partially leave, fear, and societal collapse, while others were expelled by the Jewish, Israeli fighting forces. Topic changes After the advent of the New Historians late 1980s the Israeli Jewish societal change intensified in the late 1980s. The publication of balanced, critical newspaper essays increased, the vast majority, along with balanced 1948 war veterans memoirs, about a third. At the same time, Israeli NGOs began more significantly to present the balanced and the Palestinian narratives more significantly in their publications. Moreover, Israel opened up part of its archives in the 1980s for investigation by historians. This coincided with the emergence of various Israeli historians, called New Historians, who favored a more critical analysis of Israel's history. The Arab, Palestinian official and historiographical versions hardly changed, and received support from some of the new historians. Pape calls the exodus an ethnic cleansing and points at Zionist preparations in the preceding years and provides more details on the planning process by a group he calls the consultancy. Morris also says that ethnic cleansing took place during the Palestinian exodus, and that there are circumstances in history that justify ethnic cleansing. When the choice is between ethnic cleansing and genocide, the annihilation of your people, I prefer ethnic cleansing. According to Ian Black, Middle East editor for The Guardian newspaper, the Palestinian exodus is widely described as having involved ethnic cleansing. Not all historians accept the characterization of the exodus as ethnic cleansing. Israeli documents from 1948 use the term to cleanse when referring to uprooting Arabs. Ephraim Karsh is among the few historians who still consider that most of the Arabs who fled left of their own accord or were pressured to leave by their fellow Arabs, despite Israeli attempts to convince them to stay. He says that the expulsions in Lod and Ramel were driven by military necessity. Pape's scholarship on the issue has been subject to severe criticism. 
Benny Morris says that Pape's research is flecked with inaccuracies and characterized by distortions. Ephraim Karsh refers to Pape's assertion of a master plan by Jews to expel Arabs, as contrived. Topic results of the Palestinian exodus Topic Abandoned, evacuated and destroyed Palestinian localities Several authors have conducted studies on the number of Palestinian localities that were abandoned, evacuated or destroyed during the 1947-1949 period. Based on their respective calculations, the table below summarizes their information. Source: The table data was taken from Ruling Palestine: A History of the Legally Sanctioned Jewish-Israeli Seizure of Land and Housing in Palestine. Publishers: Cohre and Badil, May 2005, p. 34. Note for information on methodologies: See Morris, Benny, 1987, The Birth of the Palestinian Refugee Problem, 1947 to 1949, New York, Cambridge University Press, 1987. Khalidi, Walid, ed. All That Remains. The Palestinian Villages Occupied and Depopulated by Israel in 1948, Washington, D.C., Institute for Palestine Studies, 1992, AP. IV, pp. XIX, 585-586, and Sitta, Salman Abu, The Palestinian Nakba 1948, London, The Palestinian Return Center, 2000. According to the Center on Housing Rights and Evictions COHRE and BADIL, Morris's list of affected localities, the shortest of the three, includes towns but excludes other localities cited by Khalidi or Abu Sitta. The six sources compared in Khalidi's study have in common 296 of the villages listed as destroyed or depopulated. Sixty other villages are cited in all but one source. Of the total of 418 localities cited in Khalidi, 292 were completely destroyed and 90 largely destroyed. COHRE and BADIL also note that other sources refer to an additional 151 localities that are omitted from Khalidi's study for various reasons, for example, major cities and towns that were depopulated, as well as some Bedouin encampments and villages vacated before the start of hostilities. Abu Siddha's list includes tribes in Beersheba that lost lands, most of these were omitted from Khalidi's work. Another study, involving field research and comparisons with British and other documents, concludes that 472 Palestinian habitations including towns and villages were destroyed in 1948. It notes that the devastation was virtually complete in some sub-districts. For example, it points out that 96.0% of the villages in the Jaffa area were totally destroyed, as were 90.0% of those in Tiberias, 90.3% of those in Safad, and 95.9% of those in Basin. It also extrapolates from 1931 British census data to estimate that over 70,280 Palestinian houses were destroyed in this period. In another study, Abu Siddha shows the following findings in eight distinct phases of the depopulation of Palestine between 1947 to 1949. His findings are summarized in the table below. Asterisk other sources put this figure at over 70,000. Source: The table data was taken from Ruling Palestine: A History of the Legally Sanctioned Jewish-Israeli Seizure of Land and Housing in Palestine. Publishers: COHRE and BADIL, May 2005, p. 34. The source being Abu Siddha, Salman, 2001, From Refugees to Citizens at Home, London: Palestine Land Society and Palestinian Return Center, 2001. Topic Palestinian refugees On the 11th of December 1948, 12 months prior to UNRWA's establishment, United Nations General Assembly Resolution 194 was adopted. The resolution accepted the definition of Palestinian refugees as persons of Arab origin who, after 29 November 1947, left territory at present under the control of the Israel authorities and who were Palestinian citizens at that date and, persons of Arab origin who left the said territory after 6 August 1924 and before 29 November 1947 and who at that latter date were Palestinian citizens, too. Persons of Arab origin who left the territory in question before 6 August 1924 and who, having opted for Palestinian citizenship, retained that citizenship up to 29 November 1947 UNRWA was established under UNGA Resolution 302 of 8 December 1949. 
It defines refugees qualifying for UNRWA's services as persons whose normal place of residence was Palestine between June 1946 and May 1948, who lost both their homes and means of livelihood as a result of the 1948 Arab-Israeli conflict and also covers the descendants of persons who became refugees in 1948. The UNRWA mandate does not extend to final status. The final 1949 UNRWA estimate of the refugee count was 726,000. On the other hand, the number of registered refugees was 914,000. The UN Conciliation Commission explains that this number is inflated by duplication of ration cards, addition of persons who have been displaced from area other than Israel held areas and of persons who, although not displaced, are destitute, and the UNWRA additionally noted that all births are eagerly announced, the deaths wherever possible are passed over in silence, as well as the fact that the birthrate is high in any case, a net addition of 30,000 names a year. By June 1951, the UNWRA had reduced the number of registered refugees to 876,000 after many false and duplicate registrations were weeded out. Today the number who qualify for UNRWA's services has grown to over 4 million. One third of whom live in the West Bank and Gaza, slightly less than one third in Jordan, 17% in Syria and Lebanon Boker, 2003, p. 72, and around 15% in other Arab and Western countries. Approximately 1 million refugees have no form of identification other than an UNRWA identification card. Topic prevention of infiltration law Following the emergence of the Palestinian refugee problem after the 1948 Arab-Israeli War, many Palestinians tried, in one way or another, to return to their homes. For some time these practices continued to embarrass the Israeli authorities until they passed the Prevention of Infiltration Law, which defines offenses of armed and non-armed infiltration to Israel and from Israel to hostile neighboring countries. According to Arab-Israeli writer Sabri Jariai, the purpose of the law was to prevent Palestinians from returning to Israel, those who did so being regarded as infiltrators. According to Kirschbaum, over the years the Israeli government has continued to cancel and modify some of the defense emergency regulations of 1945, but mostly it has added more as it has continued to extend its declared state of emergency. For example, even though the Prevention of Infiltration Law of 1954 is not labeled as an official emergency regulation, it extends the applicability of the defense emergency regulation 112 of 1945 giving the Minister of Defense extraordinary powers of deportation for accused infiltrators even before they are convicted articles 30 and 32, and makes itself subject to cancellation when the Knesset ends the state of emergency upon which all of the emergency regulations are dependent. Topic land and property laws Following its establishment, Israel designed a system of law that legitimized both a continuation and a consolidation of the nationalization of land and property, a process that it had begun decades earlier. For the first few years of Israel's existence, many of the new laws continued to be rooted in earlier Ottoman and British law. These laws were later amended or replaced altogether. The first challenge facing Israel was to transform its control over land into legal ownership. This was the motivation underlying the passing of several of the first group of land laws. Topic initial emergency laws and regulations Among the more important initial laws was Article 125 of the Defense Emergency Regulations According to Kirschbaum, the law has as effect that no one is allowed in or out without permission from the Israeli military. This regulation has been used to exclude a landowner from his own land so that it could be judged as unoccupied, and then expropriated under the Land Acquisition Validation of Acts and Compensation Law 1953. Closures need not be published in the official gazette. Topic: Absentees property laws. The absentees property laws were several laws, first introduced as emergency ordinances issued by the Jewish leadership, but which after the war were incorporated into the laws of Israel. As examples of the first type of laws are the Emergency Regulations Absentees Property Law, 5709-1948, December which according to Article 37 of the Absentees Property Law, 5710-1950, was replaced by the latter, the Emergency Regulations Requisition of Property Law, 5709-1949, and other related laws, according to COHRE and BADIL, p. 41, unlike other laws that were designed to establish Israel's legal 
control over lands, this body of law focused on formulating a legal definition for the people mostly Arabs who had left or been forced to flee from these lands. The absentee property played an enormous role in making Israel a viable state. In 1954, more than one-third of Israel's Jewish population lived on absentee property and nearly a third of the new immigrants people settled in urban areas abandoned by Arabs. Of 370 new Jewish settlements established between 1948 and 1953, 350 were on absentee property. The absentee property law is directly linked to the controversy of parallelism between the Jewish exodus from Arab and Muslim countries and the Palestinian exodus, as advocacy groups have suggested that there are strong ties between the two processes and some of them even claim that decoupling the two issues is unjust. However, Al Husseini, Palestinian governor of East Jerusalem in the Palestinian National Authority PNA, has said that the Israeli law is racist and imperialistic, which aims at seizing thousands of acres and properties of lands. <laughs> laws enacted A number of Israeli laws were enacted that enabled the further acquisition of depopulated lands. Among these laws were the Land Acquisition for Public Purposes Ordinance 1943 to authorize the confiscation of lands for government and public purposes the prescription law 5718-1958 according to COHRE and BADIL P44 this law in conjunction with the Land Settlement of Title Ordinance Amendment Law 5720-1960 the Land Settlement of Title Ordinance New Version 5729-1969 and the Land Law 5729-1969 was designed to revise criteria related to the use and registration of Miri lands one of the most prevalent types in Palestine and to facilitate Israel's acquisition of such land topic Israeli resettlement program Following the Six-Day War, Israel gained control over a substantial number of refugee camps in the territories it captured from Egypt and Jordan. The Israeli government attempted to resettle them permanently by initiating a subsidized, build your own home, program. Israel provided land for refugees who chose to participate, the Palestinians bought building materials on credit and built their own houses, usually with friends. Israel provided the new neighborhoods with necessary services, such as schools and sewers. The United Nations General Assembly passed resolutions 31-15 and 34-52, which condemned the program as a violation of the refugees' inalienable right of return, and called upon Israel to stop the program. Thousands of refugees were resettled into various neighborhoods, but the program was suspended due to pressure from the PLO. Topic. Role in the Palestinian and Israeli narratives Topic. Palestinian narrative The term, Nakba, was first applied to the events of 1948 by Constantine Zarek, a professor of history at the American University of Beirut, in his 1948 book, Mana al-Nakba, the meaning of the disaster, he wrote. The tragic aspect of the Nakba is related to the fact that it is not a regular misfortune or a temporal evil, but a disaster in the very essence of the word, one of the most difficult that Arabs have ever known over their long history." The word was used again one year later by the Palestinian poet Burhan al-Din al-Abushi, in his encyclopedia published in the late 1950s, Arif al-Arif wrote, How can I call it but Nakba? When we the Arab people generally and the Palestinians particularly, faced such a disaster Nakba that we never faced like it along the centuries, our homeland was sealed, we were expelled from our country, and we lost many of our beloved sons." Muhammad Nimr al-Hawari also used the term Nakba in the title of his book, Sir al-Nakba, The Secret Behind the Disaster, written in 1955. After the Six-Day War in 1967, Zarek wrote another book, The New Meaning of the Disaster, but the term Nakba is reserved for the 1948 war. Together with Naji al-Ali's Handala, 
the barefoot child always drawn from behind, and the symbolic key for the house in Palestine carried by so many Palestinian refugees, the collective memory of that experience the Nakba has shaped the identity of the Palestinian refugees as a people." The events of the 1948 Arab–Israeli War greatly influenced the Palestinian culture. Countless books, songs and poems have been written about the Nakba. The exodus is usually described in strongly emotional terms. For example, at the controversial 2001 World Conference Against Racism in Durban, prominent Palestinian scholar and activist Hanan Ashrawi referred to the Palestinians as, "...a nation in captivity held hostage to an ongoing Nakba, as the most intricate and pervasive expression of persistent colonialism, apartheid, racism, and victimization." Original emphasis in the Palestinian calendar, the day after Israel declared independence, the 15th of May, is observed as Nakba Day. It is traditionally observed as an important day of remembrance. In May 2009, the political party headed by Israeli Foreign Minister Avigdor Lieberman introduced a bill that would outlaw all Nakba commemorations, with a three-year prison sentence for such acts of remembrance. Following public criticism the bill draft was changed, the prison sentence dropped and instead the Minister of Finance would have the authority to reduce state funding for Israeli institutions that hold the commemorations. The new draft was approved by the Knesset in March 2011. Gada Karmi writes that the Israeli version of history is that the Palestinians left voluntarily or under orders from their leaders and that Israelis had no responsibility, material or moral, for their plight. She also finds a form of denial among Israelis that Palestinians bear the blame for the Nakba by not accepting the UN's proposed partition of Palestine into separate ethnic states. Perry Anderson writes that, The Nakba was so swift and catastrophic that no Palestinian political organization of any kind existed for over a decade after it. <laughs> Israeli narratives The approach of the State of Israel and of Israeli Jews to the causes of the Exodus are divided into two main periods, 1949–late 1970s, late 1970s nowadays. In the first period, state institutions the National Information Center, IDF and the Ministry of Education and societal ones the research community, newspapers, and 1948 war veterans' memoirs presented for the most part only the Zionist narrative of willing flight. There were some exceptions, the independent weekly Holam Haza, the Communist Party's daily, weekly Kol Ham and the socialist organization Matspen presented the Palestinian and the balanced, critical narratives. In the second period there was a split. Regarding Israeli state institutions, at least until 2004, the IDF and the Information Center continued to present the Zionist narrative. The situation in the Ministry of Education, though, was somewhat different. While until 1999 its approved history and civics textbooks presented, by and large, the Zionist narrative, since 2000, however, they have presented the critical one, at least until 2004. Similarly, in 2005, the Israeli National Archive published a book describing the expulsion of Palestinians from the cities of Lydda and Ramla in 1948. In other words, in the second period, the state institutions continued to present the Zionist narrative, some until the early 2000s, and some even onwards. From the late 1970s onward, many newspaper articles and scholarly studies, as well as some 1948 war veterans' memoirs, began to present the balanced, critical narrative. This has become more common since the late 1980s, to the fact that since then the vast majority of newspaper articles and studies, and a third of the veterans' memoirs, have presented a more balanced narrative. Since the 1990s, also textbooks used in the educational system, some without approval of the Ministry of Education, began to present the balanced narrative. In March 2015, Shai Piron, Yesh Atid Party MK, and former Education Minister of Israel, called for Israel to have all schools include the Nakba in their curriculum. I'm for teaching the Nakba to all students in Israel. I do not think that a student can go through the Israeli educational system, while 20% of students have an ethos, a story, and he does not know that story." He added that covering the topic in schools could address some of the racial tensions that exist in Israeli society. His comments broke a taboo in the traditional Israeli narrative, and conflicts with efforts on the part of some Israeli lawmakers to defund schools that mark Nakba. Comparisons with Jewish exodus from Arab and Muslim countries 
The Jewish exodus from Arab and Muslim countries was the departure, flight, migration and expulsion of 800,000 to 1 million Jews, primarily of Sephardi and Mizrahi background, from Arab and Muslim countries, mainly from 1948 onwards. The reasons for the exodus included push factors, such as state and non-state sanctioned persecution, antisemitism, political instability, poverty, disenfranchisement and expulsion, together with pull factors, such as the desire to fulfill Zionist yearnings or find a secure home in Europe or the Americas. Professor Ada Aharoni, chairman of the World Congress of the Jews from Egypt, argues in an article entitled, What About the Jewish Nakba? that exposing the truth about the expulsion of the Jews from Arab states could facilitate a genuine peace process, since it would enable Palestinians to realize they were not the only ones who suffered, and thus their sense of victimization and rejectionism will decline. Israeli historian Yehoshua Porath has rejected the comparison, arguing that the ideological and historical significance of the two population movements are totally different and that any similarity is superficial. Porath says that the immigration of Jews from Arab countries to Israel, expelled or not, was from a Jewish Zionist perspective, a fulfillment of a national dream. He notes the courageous efforts of Israeli agents working in Arab countries as Iraq, Yemen, and Morocco to assist a Jewish aliyah, and that the Jewish agency had agents, teachers, and instructors working in various Arab countries since the 1930s. Porath contrasts this with what he calls the national calamity and unending personal tragedies," suffered by the Palestinians that resulted in the collapse of the Palestinian community, the fragmentation of a people, and the loss of a country that had in the past been mostly Arabic-speaking and Islamic." The Hamas spokesman, Sami Abu Zuri, stated that the Jewish refugees from Arab countries were in fact responsible for the Palestinian displacement and that, "...those Jews are criminals rather than refugees." This came after Hanan Ashrawi a member of the PLO Executive Committee stated that Jewish refugees fleeing Arab lands because of persecution was a fabrication and that they voluntarily and collectively left. Israeli academic Yehoda Shenhev has written in an article entitled Hitching a Ride on the Magic Carpet, published in the Israeli Daily Haaretz regarding this issue. Shlomo Hillel, a government minister and an active Zionist in Iraq, adamantly opposed the analogy. I don't regard the departure of Jews from Arab lands as that of refugees. They came here because they wanted to, as Zionists. In a Knesset hearing, Rand Cohen stated emphatically, I have this to say, I am not a refugee. He added, I came at the behest of Zionism, due to the pull that this land exerts, and due to the idea of redemption. Nobody is going to define me as a refugee. United States Congress 2708 Resolutions H. Res. 185, S. Res. 85 recommend that any comprehensive Middle East peace agreement to be credible and enduring, the agreement must address and resolve all outstanding issues relating to the legitimate rights of all refugees, including Jews, Christians and other populations displaced from countries in the Middle East and encourages the Barack Obama administration to mention Jewish and other refugees as well, when mentioning Arab refugees from Palestine at international forums. The 2012 House Bill H.R. 6242 recommends to recognize the plight of 850,000 Jewish refugees from Arab countries, as well as other refugees, such as Christians from the Middle East, North Africa, and the Persian Gulf. Topic. Films Al-Nakba, The Palestinian Catastrophe 1948 is a documentary film by Benny Brunner and Alexandra Jans, that follows the events surrounding the creation of the Palestinian refugee problem. 500 Dunam on the Moon 2002 is a documentary film directed by Rachel Leah Jones, about Ein Had, a Palestinian village that was captured and depopulated by Israeli forces in the 1948 war. The Sons of Ilaban 2007 is a documentary film by Hisham Zarik that tells the story of the exodus and return of a small Palestinian village called Ilaban in 1948. The Promise 2011 is a British miniseries written and directed by Peter Kosminski, which deals with a young woman going to Israel in the present day and using her visit to investigate her soldier grandfather's part in the post-war phase of the British Mandate of Palestine. 
Gallery Topic See also 1948 Palestine War Jewish exodus from Arab and Muslim countries 1948 Palestinian exodus from Lydda and Ramel 1949 to 56 Palestinian exodus 1967 Palestinian exodus Palestinian exodus from Kuwait Gulf War Arab diaspora Palestinian diaspora Flight and expulsion of Germans 1944 to 50 History of Palestine region hash post dash mandate List of villages depopulated during the Arab-Israeli conflict New historians The ethnic cleansing of Palestine List of Arab towns and villages depopulated during the events Topic. Notes Topic. Bibliography Topic. External links The Peel Commission Report from the United Nations UN Report on Pre-War Non-Jewish Population Sands of Sorrow — Film on Refugees United Nations Program of Assistance to the Palestinian People A film about the exodus of Eilabin Institute for Palestine Studies publishes 1937 Ben Gurion Letter Anakba is a mobile app enabling users to locate, learn and contribute information about Palestinian localities destroyed in 1948.